Hello and welcome to Military HF Radio, Episode 3, HF Near Vertical Incident Skywave Propagation. I'm your host, Matthew Sherber in KF4 WZB. The agenda of the day is we're going to talk about Nivis Theory and then provide you an amazing list of recommended readings to further allow you to learn on your own. So what is Nivis? Is it a mode that you set in your radio? Can it only be used by amateur radio operators? Well, let's, let's just talk about it real quick here. It's a form of HF propagation, which depends on the correct type of antenna and frequencies to allow you to get as high takeoff angle as possible of your radio frequency energy to reach the ionosphere and return, refract off the ionosphere to return back to Earth as close as possible. So what kind of uses? If you have mountains in the way that block line of sight VHF, UHF communications, and something that people do not necessarily consider is let's say you're in Alaska and you have a mountain range that is blocking your SATCOM line of sight between your satellite antenna to the actual satellite that's located somewhere near the equator. It's actually a very low angle that you have to set your antenna in order to reach it. And that may mean going through a mountain, which obviously you can't do. So how would you communicate between some drop zone in Northern Alaska to somewhere much further south? And that might be the case. Then you can use HF radio set up in Nivis. How far out can you reach? Well, actually, it's somewhere between 300 and 500 miles. In fact, in the next slide, I'll show you the comparison between Nivis, in which there is not necessarily a skip zone that reaches only out a certain distance, and then what most people do day in and day out, which is just a long contact, long distance contact with a skip zone involved. This is important to understand fundamentally because a lot of people think they can just get a spread of frequencies throughout the HF band and they call it good. They have enough frequencies for quote unquote during the day. They have another set of frequencies they think will work during the night. And they may not realize they were not assigned frequencies low enough to allow them to communicate during the evening. So we look here between 1.6 and 30 megahertz some people say only 2 to 30 megahertz is the quote unquote HF band. But then we actually see Nivis occurring around 1.6 to 12 megahertz. I want to emphasize that it's just based on the atmospherics and the solar conditions. Just depending what's going on, if there is a much higher sunspot count, which by the way, we are at a complete lull right now, maybe up to about 4 for our sunspot number count. But if you get anywhere, you know, we're talking about we're at the peak of this, we're getting like 100, 190, you could during the day get as high as 12 megahertz uh, for your upper limit frequency to, to utilize Nivis. The best way to think about Nivis is take a water hose, full pressure, and point it straight up. And then what you're going to get is this umbrella effect. It goes up, it culminates, and then it comes and drops back down. Some of it right back on you and some of it some certain distance away. The image you see here, figure M-1, taken right out of Army Doctrine, shows the red dot, let's say that is your transmitter, and you see the signal does, does not just exit out at a single angle, it, it encompasses many different angles, and it will reach anywhere between 90, 50 degrees, and then subsequently refract off the ionosphere and come back down. Now you see where in, in case of this image, it says the F1 layers where everything's refracting off of. That depends on the time of the day. At night, just what you've learned off of my previous video in episode one on RF theory, at night F1, F2 layers combine to just the F layer, the E layer goes away, and definitely the D layer is completely out of the question at that point. But during the day, the, the D layer has a lot of absorption effects and we, we actually have to go higher in frequency during the day, lower in frequency at the night. The Nivis rule of thumb is nighttime, you're looking anywhere between 1.8 and 4.9 megahertz to still operate in that same 
300 to 500 mile footprint. And during the day, you may have to actually move up to around 5 to 8 megahertz, maybe even as high as 12 megahertz. Again, depending on subspot count and some other uh, atmospheric condition that might happen. So let's look at a comparison. We're going to look at Nivis propagation on the left and what we can just call skip wave to the right. So Nivis propagation, I said, can reach out as far as 300 to 500 miles from the transmitter site. In this case, you can see that you can cover the entire New England area and then some using just Nivis. What does that mean about the area that is beyond uh, the light colored blue into this dark blue region? The dark blue region, the signal is not propagating out to at all. And so now you have the ability to communicate where your signal is isolated to just that region. That means that people outside of this, if you want to call it, um, it's almost as large as an area of responsibility, but area of operation, now those folks can't hear you when you're doing Nivis. Now some of you might say, well, you've, you've got this dot somewhere near Buffalo and we need to talk to Florida or Arizona. How do we do that? Well, you're not going to be using Nivis. You're going to be using you know, much uh, different type of antenna setup and also frequency in order to reach that. I will be talking about how to plan that out in episode four, talking about VOACAP that will help model what frequencies and types of antenna you need. Now let's go over to skip wave. If the same time of day, or this is late in the evening for this part of the world, but it's 2200 UTC, and you go up to 10.1 megahertz, what do you notice? There is a large dark blue region close to where your transmitter is, indicated by that red dot. That means that the same time of day, same modulation scheme, single sideband, at the same power I put 25 watts, the same dipole antenna at five meters above the ground, roughly 17 feet above the ground. By being off by that much in your frequency, you're not talking to anybody within that area of operation. And that's why it's so critical to understand HF radio and frequencies and time of day. Because during the day, 10.1 megahertz may actually look like the propagation chart on the left. But in the evening, it's doing this now. And so what you have is what's called a skip zone. That skip zone is everywhere that is dark blue within the darker regions of the, of the orange and the red. We're, we're looking top down at this umbrella, if you will. So you need to understand how to use VOACAP. That will be episode four. You need to understand that this is what Nivis is and that you can cover an entire region. And more so than that, if you get it just right, you can actually talk within the three to 500 mile radius, meaning that you could actually talk ground wave, so line of sight, if you will, okay, ground wave out to around 50 miles and then even beyond out to as far as uh, 500 miles theoretically. You can do this at the halt with a standard dipole antenna. You can do this on the move. And I will cover that in a future episode on the types of antennas that you can use mobile and at the halt. Now, some people have learned that dipole antennas, you have to set at a certain direction, an azimuth, because it only goes out two uh, different directions. It's, it's not omnidirectional. That's actually not true. Uh, for some reason, people keep teaching it that way. Dipole antenna, no matter what azimuth you have it at, when you're using Nivis, the signal is going uh, high angle takeoff and going straight up. At that point, off the ionosphere, the polarization, we cover this in episode one, talking about polarization, either vertical or horizontal. And then when you know about a dipole antenna, in this case, we're talking about a horizontal dipole. It's not horizontal once it uh, refracts off the ionosphere. At that point, it's random. In which case, it does not matter which azimuth you set up your dipole antenna within that area of operation. You do not need to tell each unit which way to point their dipole antenna. That's appealing because when you start talking about having to 
direct your antennas from one station to the other, there's going to be many stations, not just two. And you would start thinking to yourself, I need to keep moving this antenna around in order to reach everybody. No, that's not the case at all. Standard horizontal dipole antenna, um, you know, 17 feet off the ground, as low as that. And you can talk to anybody in that, that region. Um, in order to help your signal uh, increase its, its high takeoff pattern, you could put another uh, piece of wire, uh, a parasitic element, if you will, kind of like when we're talking about uh, Yagi Uda antenna, uh, but for a, a horizontal dipole, you could put that wire right on the ground, right underneath your dipole, and that actually helps direct the signal uh, at, a, at a higher takeoff angle, it helps improve um, your signal. So there you have it. There, there is a visual now of what Nivis looks like in comparison to if you are going a much longer distance, and that all depends on the frequency. So there is not some setting, magical setting on your radio that you push and you're using Nivis versus just what we say is long range uh, HF communications. And this is why it's important to understand. So I want to keep this video short. Here are some amazing recommended readings, almost all of which are authored, co-authored uh, by uh, Lieutenant Colonel Retired Dave Feidler or his other uh, partner there, Lieutenant Colonel Retired Ed Farmer, uh, two of the most prolific writers in military HF radio communications and more specifically near vertical and sin skywave. So what you do is you go to the U.S. Army Signal Corps website, specifically their Army Communicator magazine, at this link, just type it in, and I'll also uh, get this posted within the video uh, when it's uploaded so that you can just click on it in the comment section. They have Beyond Line of Sight Communications, and what you're gonna look for is where I have in parentheses Fall 1983, that's the Fall 1983 edition that you would just look up in that archive website. At first, there was very few editions that went out the way they labeled them, so they did it by uh, the season and the year, and then later on, more formally, a year volume um, edition and, and the number. Out of all of these, though they're all great to read, the last three in gold, ANPRC 150 HF radio in urban combat, mobility favors small antennas, and HF combat net radio lesson learned again, are, are the three must reads, but definitely read everything because it gives you a lot of good historical information and really just how long we've been talking about this. I know a lot of people are like, oh, all these people are reinventing the wheel or talking about it again. But in, in honestly, it's been talked about over and over and physics do not change over, over the, the decades. Maybe the uh, better radio receivers are out there now and, and better digital modulation schemes are out there, but really the physics are still there. The antennas are still there. So it's worth a read to understand this better. But I hope you're looking forward to the next episode on actually how to use VOACAP, the program, also the, the online version of it, in order to help you understand between you and another station what frequencies there are uh, to use, what type of antennas you should set up to utilize that. If you like this, please subscribe, like the video, and again, the, these videos will be starting to come out uh, in rapid fire here to help educate you, um, not even train, but to educate you in the world of HF and the different ways you can communicate. So thank you very much.